Welcome to How the Song Came to Be, where soulful songwriters share the stories behind their songs, as well as tools and creative practices you can use to bring your best songs or other creative works to life. I'm Ann Heaton, your host. And I talk about that a lot in writing is that uh, you don't have to go home from the prom who you brought to the prom with writing. Even if it's your kick-ass title, even if it's the most magnificent idea for a title that you have, if you get to that point in the song where the song is coming together and the title isn't working, yeah, or your hook isn't working, give your hook the hook, man. Welcome, songwriters. I'm Ann Heaton, your host and founder of Soul Song School. We are here with very special guest, Vance Gilbert. Vance Gilbert was born and raised in Philadelphia and began his musical journey wanting to be a jazz singer. Soon he discovered he had an affinity for the storytelling aspects of acoustic folk music. Um, he's released, I hope this is right, 12 albums to date. Probably 12. <laughs> he was a special guest on Sean Colvin's Fat City Tour and he has been the opener for an opener of choice for acts such as George Carlin, Aretha Franklo, Franklin, Anita Baker, and Arlo Guthrie. Uh, most recently, he's the opener of choice for Paul Reiser and the Subdudes. Gilbert's compositions can employ sophisticated melodies and harmonies, and he is a true storyteller. In addition, very to sophisticated. Being, now, careful, sophisticated. <laughs> in addition to being very funny, uh, he, isn't ha he even has a tune on a Grammy-nominated children's album. Welcome to the show, Vance Gilbert. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks yeah, for having me. Yeah, I'm good so happy you're here. Good, good things are happening. In fact, next weekend I open for Paul Reiser. Uh, out in Colorado, and uh, it looks like I might have a couple tunes on a Mike Posner album coming up. Oh, wow. Which, which would, uh, you can't see the minivan out on the street, out the window there, but maybe that'll pay off the minivan. I don't know. <laughs> I would love to pay off that minivan. <laughs> well, we can hope, yeah. Would you start us off with a song? Sure. Thank you. You can live on pie and whiskey But you surely won't live too long One is as sweet as your very first kiss The other gonna go down strong Neither one will sustain you other make your belly lame and go all wrong. You can live on pie and whiskey, but you surely won't live too long. You can sing yourself a lullaby like your mama sang to you. Hers was just like a ring of a bell, yeah. Yours is like a worn out shoe. She had a voice just like honey. Yours just like leather, nails, and glue. You can sing yourself a lullaby like your mama sang to you. Oh, oh, Yesterday to come and go. I 
blackjack with pie and whiskey. Kidnap your mama's soul. Oh, but worn out shoe. Well, they're made for walking. You better get walking, but you ain't gonna be here long. You can cry, cry, cry like no tomorrow. You can sing yourself a lullaby. You can live on pie and whiskey. But you surely won't live too long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yay! Thank you. Thanks oh, for starting us pleasure. off that way. Yeah. That's my pleasure. So here, here's what I know about you. I know that you can't go to a Vance Gilbert show and not, like I just get in a room with you and I smile, but you can't go to a Vance Gilbert show and not smile or laugh or sometimes even cry. Um, you're such an amazing storyteller and not just in your songs, um, but also in the the things that you say in between songs, the stories you tell. And I definitely want to dive into some of your storytelling strategies, if you're willing. Absolutely. In, in a minute. But first, I want to start with a question that I start, that I ask everyone at the beginning, which is how and why did you start writing songs? What compelled you to begin? Um, I th think, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to delve into the storytelling thing because that was the reason why I started writing songs. I, as a kid, I was, my, the closest sibling was 10 years older than me and my only brother. And uh, that made for three parents. So I had to do a lot of self-entertaining. And I did that by telling stories to myself. I didn't really try to be a songwriter, singer, anybody or anything until... Uh, you know, almost 20 years later when I was in college. But um, that's what started me off on this. And then I heard, uh, I heard so many people telling stories in their songs, people from, from my upbringing, from uh, Smokey Robinson and, and uh, uh, the Beatles, as I was listening to AM radio as a kid uh, in Philadelphia. And then I got to college everyone had an acoustic guitar and I figured I didn't want to be left out of, of the fray. So I got an acoustic guitar and learned a couple chords and started messing around with it there. And I've gone through so many uh, wonderful permutations. I became a jazz snob for quite a few years. And, and uh, then it was a time where uh, for about a year, all I'd listened to was uh, English folk rock, like a, uh, 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 June Tabor and Matty Pryor, the Silly Sisters, were on repeat for forever, you know. And uh, I also played a lot of cocktail music and did a lot of bossa nova stuff. And what always ended up being the center of what I would do would be the storytelling aspect of any of that, even the jazz. Um, you know, there was there was always the storytelling songs that got me. Um, uh, guess who I saw today or Duke Ellington's sophisticated lady. Those songs always struck me because they were really, they were telling a story from the top to the bottom. And um, that's always a cornerstone to what I've been about as a kid. So that's how I got into playing acoustic music. I wanted to, I played bass in a couple of bands, but I really wanted to be the gregarious out front person with something to say. That's so cool. So, what I hear you saying is when you were a kid, I'm, when you were telling those stories, did they just need to be funny to you or entertaining to you? Were you then sharing them with others or they were just filling up your imagination space? I, it was uh, more the latter to start. It was filling up imagination space. And then I realized that, uh, I realized at one point I was funny. When I knew I was funny when I would tell one of these stories and one of my friends would pee. I was like, why? You pee, man. You pee. I can't help it, Vince. You're funny, man. You made me laugh. You made me pee. I was like, that's pretty powerful. <laughs> and you can cause somebody. Oh, yeah. You can cause a seven or eight-year-old, a co-seven or eight-year-old to pee. Yeah. That's pretty powerful stuff. 
P. I love that. It's like the early feedback. It's just sort of like, wait, I have this P power. I call it P back. It's a thing. Yeah. P back. P power. P power. <laughs> And then your favorite songs by artists who weren't necessarily always doing storytelling songs were the storytelling songs. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's where I gravitated okay. uh, um, to, to, you know, I, all of them from, from the early R&B and pop to the jazz to, to anything else. There was always a story involved there. Now that doesn't mean that I don't try to write a song that is an anti-story telling song. Right, right. I attempted because some songs are magnificent in their um, in their ability to be evocative. Right. And you go, and the song goes by, and you go, "What just happened?" And your other self answers, "I don't know, but I dug it." But I liked it. Yeah, Sean and Clinton. I don't need, and I don't need to know. <laughs> right. You're right. Sean Coleman. Uh, you know, when, when you hear when you hear China gets broken and it may never be the same ships on the ocean find their way back again i was weaving what who knows i know what it's about because i've asked her but who knows what that song is about yeah yeah steady on steady on what you know yeah yeah no but totally so magnificent as it goes by you're struck you're, and you're taken and you're you're taken on a journey and um uh, you you have your own you might even have your own meeting how often does that happen to us well sometimes i feel like you have to make a decision at some point of which which one you're doing and i know some of like the songwriters i work with will be like well i don't necessarily want people to know what i'm talking about and and, and sometimes i feel like that's a, just a choice of being lazy and other times I feel like it's a legitimate choice. Um, well, with any songwriting, I mean, you, you do that with any songwriting. That's, that's going to be, uh, you know, whether they're storytelling or being, uh, 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 or just splashing pictures, you know, there's good and bad and all of that. But yeah. I think sometimes, sometimes the song chooses for you. Yeah, that's, oh, that's totally true. Okay, yeah. sorry. Now, I'm just going to interrupt because I'm no, just please, too excited. Please. All right, no so back to, the, back to the storytelling strategy. So I'm just, I'm just going to use myself as an example. So obviously, you had this early feedback that you were naturally funny. Yes. But I'm assuming now as an adult, you've, you've honed your craft and there's things that you actually think about. Um, I'll, I'll use me as an example, just as a jumping off point. Like sometimes if I want something to really come across or I want it to be funny, I'll just think like, how would I tell this to my brothers? Like, you know what I mean? Because in a, in a big family, you don't like have the floor all the time. So you got to like, you got to get to the point, you got to make it clear and you got to pick the, the most important thing. So I, I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, how, how, how do you know that you're telling the story, right? What are the like strategies you use? Well, one of the things, that some of the strategies are stolen. And the first stolen parts of these strategies are, are, are taken from the great comics. Um, uh, the, uh, rest his soul, uh, 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 George Carlin, or uh, and rest his soul too, in a matter of speaking, Bill Cosby, uh, Richard Pryor. These, these great, great storytellers were part of my uh, lexicon coming up. I mean, when I wasn't listening... If there was something spinning on the turntable and it wasn't music, it was a comedy album by one of these people or, or Red Fox or really, really reaching back now. Mm -hmm. And um, we ended up in our house being really good storytellers, all of us. Mm -hmm. you know, people, people could summarize part of their day verbally. And uh, that, that, so some of the strategies, how, how you like to say, are, are, come from absolute thievery i'll i'll just say it right up that that uh you know uh, uh, like a blah 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 this song uh, I, I was born in philadelphia and then my parents moved to new jersey but i found them you're gonna laugh right there right you're, right. you're in and that's right. a that's an old uh, that's an old I don't know if it's old vaudeville or old black joke I don't know but I make it I make it my own and it becomes part of my lexicon and by the time I tell that little snippet 
people are people are are are, are gripping and they're ready to to hear the rest of the story. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I'll say to performers uh, when I'm teaching is that uh, bravo on you telling the story, but the song should be doing the multitude of the work. I mean, I think the thing that where a story may fail is when the uh, story is supplanting the song's work. And you can smell when that happens. When you, and you realize, you know what, that song is not done. They're not finished the song because they're telling me what the song is about. As soon as somebody tells me what the song is about, I am uh, very curious as to where that's going to go. Okay, so I want to get like really concrete with that. But first, I want to highlight what you just said. So that thing you did with the, you found them, your, your parents, mm -hmm. is basically you surprised the audience. So you kind of like took a twist and then yep, sure. you got their buy-in. Like once you laugh at someone, like a belly laugh, you're, you have, you know, you have their buy-in. I, I, I think that's, I think that's very true. I yeah. Think that's, I, I mean, I, I just laughed. I mean, like I'm not, we're not even at a show. Okay. So when someone's telling you what the song is about, can you say, I think I know what you mean, but just for the songwriters listening, can you say what you mean? Like give an example. Well, here's when I'm teaching. My my have my rules are: um, please don't tell me what the song is about, unless uh, this unless the introduction to the song is historical or hysterical. So yeah. uh, let's take each one of those. Oh, I like that. Yeah. If if uh, for example, uh, Peter Mulvey does this incredible introduction to a couple of songs where he talks about talking to his astronomer buddy Vlad, and he talks about how quick the universe could be just mushed out in when, when you think about time. And it's, it's a piece unto itself. <clears throat> so it's, it's hysterical. So it's, it's very funny. And then he does probably a wonderfully poignant song of which he has many. So in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of cheating way, he's gotten two performance pieces out of the deal. Mm -hmm. One of them being the introduction to the song mm -hmm. the other uh historical one might be somebody like richard Schindel, who can write out of a place uh, where he's talking about uh the civil war i mean he's uh I, I can't remember the name of the exact song but he's got this line in it where this woman civil war uh bride is out looking at the men that are coming about dousing for her husband's face oh my god well, you, you have to place that into some sort of historical context. Yeah. And he might talk about for a second what part of the Civil War that was in or such. But if somebody starts their song, I wrote this song when I was feeling, I'm like, oh, God. Yeah. You know, or this yeah. song is, the other one is the more fledgling one. Uh, this song is about dot, dot, dot. As yeah. soon as I hear this song is about, I, I, I'm dubious. Yeah. I hate to yeah. paint such a dark picture of it, but yeah, I, I, I'm, do, I'm immediately dubious. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let me, let me add one other thing. I, I, one thing, and I also don't want songwriters to feel, it's okay if you're, if you're just starting to play out and you need to say something to not feel nervous and you say, this song is about my male, it's not the end of the world, but this is something to shoot for. And then also, Yes, this is the end thing, of the song though. No, I, you know what? New fledgling songwriters, here's what I'm going to tell you to do. Yeah, say it. If you're nervous, greet the audience. Tell them hello. Don't ask them how they are. Tell them hello. Take a step back off the mic, step back in, play your song. Mm. Get out of the way of the song. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to see, I don't want nerves to tell me what the song's about. Okay, let me just highlight yeah, and, and interject one thing. Get out of the way of the song. I want to highlight that you said that your introduction to songs should either be historical or hysterical. Yeah. And I want to add this and get your take on this. One thing, I'm, you're talking about Peter Mulvey telling a story about a guy, an astronomer named Vlad, right? So one thing I would add is if you tell the story about the astronomer named Vlad, then you don't, don't then play the song and be like, there was an astronomer named Vlad. You know, like, Absolutely. we need to move on from there to some other aspect of it. It's not... Absolutely. Absolutely. Because if you're going to say it in the song, you don't don't tell us. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, there, and we have both seen performers that will tell a story, take a couple beats, and say, uh, and the story ends, and that has nothing to do with this song. 
and they start playing their song. I think that's hysterical. Again, that's a little baby performance piece. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. I think that's, I think we should put ourselves in the position of letting these songs speak as much as they can for themselves. Mm-hmm. Because that is what, we, that's what we're doing. Yeah. That's what we do. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about within the, because I want to talk about within the, the song and then I want to talk in between the song. It's hard to know which one to start with. But let's start, start within the song. So um, what's that song you have, like Old White Men or something? Yes. Okay, that, or that even, or even like 26 Reasons. I know they're very different feeling songs, yeah. but like, let, let's start with... Reasons well, I'll like, never play again. I haven't played that since. <sighs> all right, for, so for... But okay. uh, Old White Men speaks for itself right out, right out the gate. Uh, there's a picture. But what I, I want to know... A, I was such a strange boy. 40 years or so back then. Fat with big, thick old glasses. I had trouble making friends. Cruising through my neighborhood. Could easily have come to no good end Till I stumbled into the workshops of old white men I'm very satisfied with that because I don't have to explain that song. Here it was. I painted, I started by painting a picture of this kid. Everybody knows that kid. I don't, I don't have to, and I have done it. And this song goes out to all of you that are mentors and don't even know that you're mentors. You look over your shoulder and the next thing you know, you're in that position. I was such a strange boy. Or this song is going out to that guy over there that I know is uh, just retired from the Air Force working on planes. I was such a strange boy. So mm. this song has got, it's a song is doing its own work. But I've brought the audience, I've kind of just opened the door. Mm -hmm. But there's no reference to the song at all. I'm telling my story. Yeah, so if you want to hear Old White Men and you haven't heard it, go to vancegilbert.com and then you can hear the whole song that we're, that we're talking about. And in it, you list a lot of characteristics of old white men. And I would like to know just concretely when you were writing this, I'm assuming you had the idea, did you, did you then like make a list of of traits or characteristics you you'd noticed about old white men and then you kind of brought it into lyrics or what was the process around that yeah there's always a list there's a list there's a and it's scattered around the page uh of uh, uh, because uh, the chorus uh, the chorus comes around each time and does something a little bit different but and it goes from uh, that's the one uh, G A B C goes to the four. Oh, white man, get teary eyed December 7th. Oh, white man, salute every flag they see. Old white man, yeah, there's a list of things, but uh, my job then is to drop this, drop portions of this list into uh, a remembrance in a poetic fashion. So, yeah, the, the earlier pages in the notebook have lists of stuff. Um, and in fact, uh, later, thinking about the things that the quote-unquote old white man taught me, uh, there's, it was all ball-peen hammers and calipers, dovetail joints and acetone, tubes and printed circuits, screws and spokes and wheels. That's like nine things. Ten, maybe. That's ten things. Right, but you fit it, it in like two lines or something, yeah, right? That, it's a list that is trying to be as A.A. Uh, uh, a. Milne slash Dr. Seuss uh, uh, poetically put as possible. But it is indeed a list of things. Succinct and rhyming? Um, I guess, sometimes. When you said Dr. Seuss, I just wondered if it... You'd have uh, to say well, it again. Well, it, it wasn't the rhyming part of Dr. Seuss that... Uh, I was thinking of, I'm more thinking of the fact that Dr. Seuss would be uh, inclusive in having these things in, in the list. Okay. Uh, he might get them to rhyme. Yeah. I'm going to step away from that and maybe not rhyme. Yeah. Ball, peen, hammers, and calipers. I mean, the alliteration takes care of whatever rhyme I don't end up with. 
So I'm really happy with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Printed circuits, screws and spokes and wheels. That's very Susian. That's screws beautiful. And wheels. No matter how you feel, use your screws and spokes and wheels. You know, it's, 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 it, and sometimes it's a matter of trust. I say that to all songwriters. Like, spit that stuff out on the, on the page and trust that. Because so often when we go to write and that pen comes down, the editor comes on right away. Oh, oh my gosh. This song has to be at least as good. This word has to be at least as good as something Ann Heaton would come up with. And, you know, in reality, all it needs to be is as good as the story that you're telling. And then you need to get the hell out of the way. Step, yeah. Spill that story on the page. Yeah, I, I mean, I know young writers who will just, they'll actually start writing lyrics. But I, I'll do that occasionally if I'm walking. But I just am writing, like I say, just just write and don't edit it. Later you can make it lyrics. So I'll make my, my list might be like, if I'm making a list, like I made a list when I wrote Hey, uh, hey New York was like, comparing Chicago to New York. I was just making lists of like, what, what is New York like? What is Chicago like? What's good about it? What do I think is funny? What do I hate about it? Whatever. Obviously, 85% of that didn't make it into the song, but by just writing it and not editing it, I could find the little, you know, and then I said, what's, what's most necessary or what's most poignant or what's right. funniest? Right. I'm going to use that. And then I would play around. I mean, I'm amazed when something comes out sounding cool or the words, but it doesn't always work like that for me. So, Right. I mean, this is where, this is where some of it, um, inspiration, perspiration adages get thrown around and such. And, you know, you did, you did a lot of your work in your head before the rhymes came out. Um, to be clear, I mean, you've been at it for a while and there are, there are times where the edit, I mean, Ellis Paul is like that. His notebooks, man, I, you know, you flip through an Ellis Paul notebook and there are pages where there's not a lot, it doesn't look like a lot of work because mm. he just wrote it down. I mean, he does a lot of editing in his head. I mm. can't, mm. I need to, I need to kind of hurl on the page and then, and brush away, uh, chaff and then start to, uh, to, to uh, winnow down. Um, I w I've always wondered, I've always been dying to know what Lucinda Williams' notebooks look like. Oh, yeah. You know, because the songs are, uh, uh, you, know, you, wait, you wait in the car by the side of the road. I was like, where did you, how do you get these images? Where do you, where do they come from? I'm, I'm hoping that it's more complicated at some point, and then she takes it and does like that. Yeah, if she well, I, like that, that would be even be so, I mean, it's so fun to kind of, I never thought about this until somebody asked me to, to teach songwriting, and I was like, teach songwriting? Like, I, well, I don't know, even know what I'm doing. And then, but to reverse engineer it, and now, like the curiosity, like I would love, you know, I would love to see your first, your first list. Oh, and then, me like too. your second thing. And then, I mean, if oh. you save it, it probably like my stuff ends up, it's like on yeah. napkins. But if I saved it, I feel like it would be really fun to show people like, okay, here was the initial idea. Then this happened. Then exactly. I wrote five pages. And then. Exactly. You know, and then people would be like, oh, it's a process. Like I don't need yeah. to like write this amazing thing. I think one of the things that uh, has happened in the last batch of years for me writing wise is um, a, I, I, you know, I, I kind of don't like to talk all the time about a method, but there's a two notebook method. So you have two writing notebooks and you write, you know, your really scratchy version in the top notebook, starting on one page and having it go to the other page, right? Then you go down to the next notebook and you kind of clean up what you've done at the top. I like that. Then at the top, you can turn that page and you put that one below the other notebook. And you start cleaning more and adding more if you need to on the sides, you know. But the, the deal with, with this is, for me, and I don't say this works for everybody, it turns off the editor. And what I mean by that is, if I'm writing in one notebook and I fill the page, and I, if I turn that page and I have a blank piece of paper, man, the editor comes on. Like you turn the page and say, let me write a cleaner copy of the next version of this, and you start writing this cleaner copy, I shut down. 
So what you're saying is that first notebook, you're not allowed to, the editor's not invited into that first notebook. Hell no. Never. No. You have to do that in the other notebook. You can bring pieces in. Yes. The, the first notebook is just for writing. Yes. Okay. I love and then that. the second notebook, second, second notebook, there is some editing going on, but it is also open for just for writing because the song is laid out in front of you. You don't have to turn the page to go, oh, what am I doing here? I feel like turning that page is just, that's a fresh page. You turn the page to write this thing down again. It's, you have to turn it back to see what you've written. And that back and forth with that piece of paper, for me, is editor. Mm. That editor comes in fat. Whereas if I can just go right down here and start writing it down, I might correct something and say, no, you know what? I'm getting rid of that word as I write it down. Oh, but this is cool. Let me put that up in the corner of this second page. So mm -hmm. the second page ends up, the editor has come into the room, uh, but, but the creative Vance is still working around the margins. Whereas if I turn that page, it's all editor, man. I'm writing the th song down, and I got nothing new to say. Mm, I like that. And it's it, weird, but it, 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 it has worked for me. So songwriters listening, that is something you could try. I may try that. I like that. It reminds me of something, I don't do it in that way, but like when I, I'll go down in a Word document and start to like clean up. And, and some, I don't know if you ever find this where like, I'll start to fix something and get it, you know, like tighter. And then I, sometimes I too early, like kill something that was good, you know? And then it's just, and then I'll go back to the original and I'll be like, oh, this felt so much more alive. Oh, I know. Cause it's missing this, you know, I, I killed something good, you know? Um, or got rid of it. So, so it just makes me think you still have the first notebook, you know, even if the finished oh, songs end up in the second notebook, absolutely. you can always go back. Yeah. You'll never, you never know what, um, you know, I have one buddy said to me that he loved the idea of writing on his computer because he didn't have to marry anything he was writing. And I talk about that a lot in writing is that, um, you don't have to go home from the prom who you brought to the prom with writing. Even if it's your kick-ass title, even if it's the most magnificent idea for a title that you have, if you get to that point in the song where the song is coming together and the title isn't working, yeah, or your hook isn't working, give yeah. your hook the hook, man. Yeah. You set, know? Your, set your hook free to go to another song. <laughs> I mean, that's great to do. That's great to do if you're at the computer because you have permission to do that at the computer. Yeah. But the downside of that is that um, with my adult memory, if I, if I get rid of it, maybe I'll forget that it was there and maybe it had something seminal that works for me later. Yeah. I'm just looking to see, cool. uh, uh, see what he sees because uh, cleaning people are coming a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I love that. You don't have to, go to you don't have to leave yeah, the same person you went to the prom with that's like a yeah, great oh, oh. oh i have some great <laughs> adages here's another one yeah. with that with that piece that you that you wrote yeah that isn't going to work now in this song yeah put it up on blocks in the yard you can do that to a whole song just like an old car it's kind of a an urban rural image but you put it up on blocks in the yard you can strip it for parts you can wait for a while to order new parts for it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many things you can do with that song, but it doesn't have to not exist. I mean, it can still exist, but you can move on. It's still there. I it's, love, I love that. Isn't it? I love great? that. I, mean, I love the use it for, I need stuff to be simple. So if you make, give me a simple image, you know, um, yeah. And I remember, I re I remember I wrote a song once that I just felt like I, I couldn't let it be in the world because it might be too sad for a certain person. So I, re I, I used it for parts. I, I recycled it. I took the part I could and then I put it into a different story that was fiction, but right. it had the same like emotional center. So I felt like, okay, cool. I didn't waste, <laughs> I didn't waste right. the parts. Yeah. I oh, that. I had somebody come over my house. <clears throat> oh my goodness. Almost uh, over 25 years ago. And uh, we were just, we'd get together once every couple of months or so to song swap. And she brought this, uh, she brought this uh, piece over and it started like this. 
My mother moved the furniture. She no longer moved the man. We thought nothing of it at the time. She said, I could never play that out. I could never play that out. It was Jonathan. Oh, and really? Yeah, she brought that up. She said, I'll never, I'll never play that. Not while my mom's alive. But in truth, she turned it into something that was, that she could use it. She ended up using it. But she was, she was petrified of yeah. uh, her mom hearing that potentially crucifying dicta about her, you know? Right, right. That but, would hurt her feelings. Yeah, man. Yeah, but, absolutely. You know, yeah. Those are little levels of the game. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You, you can usually find a way, some way. I think so. I think so. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I'm moving along. I, want, I do want you to play another song but, um, and before we end, but is, can you, I, when we were talking before, you said you might take a, a Herbie Hancock. Like, what's, what, I want to know what's like super alive for you in your like creative life right now. Like, what are you most psyched about? And is, could it possibly be that class? Or I don't know, just. Anything. You know, it's not that class in particular. Um, that's just, just a thought I've been giving in. Um, the thing that's got me super alive right now is some upcoming things. And uh, more situational rather than writing. I'm, I'm going to end up, uh, starting in November, I'm touring Australia for seven weeks. So, yeah, so that's going to be a part of a, what they call it, a tour of small halls. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and then there's two festivals down there that I'm playing. So that should be uh, excellent. Um, this kid, uh, Mike Posner, uh, had a hit uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, I took a pill in Ibiza, prove a Vinci I was cool. He is really hot on uh, a bunch of my songs. So I went out and recorded with him. And we'll see what ends up on the album. But, um, you know, we'll see what happens with that. So I'm kind of resting on... Uh, fake laurels right now um, but I guess the, the, uh, the final thing I'm excited about is the fact that I do indeed have I've got I've got 10 songs and I need 12 so I think there will be two or three more songs that come up uh, that that will give me closure on whatever the next album is going to be yeah so, yeah. so there's a there's an al a new album in the works in in my head, yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah. yeah. And yeah. you get to write those last two or three songs. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, Do my gosh. A... I love how deep you're willing to, to dig in on, on these things. Oh, um, I could talk to you for hours. But, yeah. Do you have a song in mind that you want to that you wanna tell us the story of how, how it came to be and uh, play it for us? Uh, let me play Goodbye, Pluto. Mm -hmm. when I bought it, I don't know what happened. Uh, Goodbye Pluto is basically uh, three kind of large verses and sort of with A, B kind of thing going on. And the bridge is comic because there's no words in the bridge because I was very brave and I said that, you know what, I don't need to say anything more. And uh, I've, it's a, filled with details, filled with list stuff like you were talking about. But the last verse was a placeholder. And the last verse uh, was what the song ended up being about. So uh, not to be so clinical. Goodbye, Pluto. So long to your tradition and your solo life's ambition of just whirling around the sun. Goodbye, Pluto. Being number nine was nice till you lost your planetary status. Now you're simply rocket ice. There are eight that spin before you and they use up all the rays that the sun gives to your children to turn the night to day. So goodbye, Pluto. I know it doesn't seem quite fair. 3,000 million miles away. God just leaves you there, and I think I understand. When the spin gets out of hand, sometimes 
all that's left is how to say goodbye. Goodbye, Pluto. All this bidding you would do. Ah, but both of us know better that you're orbiting me through. Never mind them, Pluto. With one roll around the sun, 250 years go by, and when that year is done, by that time, Pluto, they'll be dead and gone to dust. Taking their equations with them, their opinions gone to rust, and I think I understand when the spin gets out of hand. Sometimes all that's left is how to say goodbye. La 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 Goodbye old me You were useful while you lasted Now I'm dropping off that bastard that kept springtime out of reach. Farewell, you world familiar, as you track your way through space. There comes a time when all of us are done and get replaced. So goodbye, Pluto. You'll be salty for a while. But a couple trips around old Saul, and you'll be back in style, and I think I understand. When the spin gets out of hand, sometimes all that's left is how to say goodbye. Sometimes all that's left is how to say goodbye. Wow. Yeah, thanks. I love that. Thanks. Wow. Thank you so much. So well, thank you for this opportunity. This was uh, great to talk to you about this stuff. This is just so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, thank before you. I let you go, do you have one last, I, I mean, I could like talk to you about just that song for another hour, but I'm <laughs> trying to keep within the time, time, param time parameters of the of the series. So, um, is if you had one piece of parting advice um, to offer songwriters and creative souls out there, what would it be? I just keep writing. It really is. I know this is. I, I saw you sag like, oh, Vance. No, because no, it's true. Just write. Just keep writing. I, 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 I feel like um, I have some students that wonder why they're doing it. They're, they're, not getting, uh, they're, they're not getting the open mic features. People aren't clapping enough or this or that and the other. And I just keep saying, you know, you've got, you've got a legacy and, and a story to tell. And you're making community. And it's always important. It's always what you have to say is important. Uh, even if it doesn't tell it a particular story uh right uh, be evocative uh, do it f for you do it f do it for your kids do it for somebody else's kids that might see it uh leave that legacy just write i love it thank you vance oh are you kidding me thank you you're, you're amazing okay you're amazing. no you no you okay all right you. <laughs> bye Thanks so much for joining us. If you know someone who would enjoy or benefit from this podcast, please share it with them. Thanks so much. Much love.